going to be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 5. And for those of you with the Bible apps, we're using the NIV. This is one of the great word pictures of the Bible and one of the most triumphant passages of the Bible in many ways. And when you see this going through your mind, just imagine how much better it's going to be in person. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is he to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and praise. Then I heard every creature in earth, and on earth, and under the sea, and on the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be praise, and honor, and glory, and power, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Well, it's a great delight to be with you uh, again today uh, and a great privilege to be preaching from uh, this passage in Revelation. If you'll know the book, that uh, this book of Revelation, you'll know that John sees uh, a vision of an open door and an invitation, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. Human beings are naturally self-centered. We naturally regard ourselves as the center of reality and of importance. When you're a baby, that's a very appropriate thing to do, I might say. But when you're an adult, it's time to give up being self-centered. But not only are humans prone to self-centeredness, but the human race is prone to self-centeredness as well. We think that we have all the power and authority. Indeed, today, many people think that they are self-creating beings. Having dropped the idea of God... They think that our duty is to create ourselves, and what a solemn duty that must be to be a self-creator, to create your own reality, your own moral values, your own identity, your own sense of your place in the world, yet that is a pressure that our society is putting on young children even today. That's what happens when you give up believing in God. 
You have to replace God with something, and here in the West, we replace it with ourselves as the rulers of the universe. But this is a lie. There is one ruler of the universe because there is in heaven one throne with someone sitting on it. There is one control center, one being who controls this universe. And if there is one God, then there is one ruler, one reality, one creator, one provider, one judge, one universe, one truth, one morality, one who we must all depend on, serve, praise, thank and glorify. There is one whom we must honour, love and know. Polytheists believe there are many gods. Atheists believe there is no God, no reality, no fundamental reality, only billions of mini-realities created by ourselves. But no, we are all creatures of one creator, and all that is, is the creature of one creator. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. A scroll is a rolled up piece of paper. The seals are not the kind of seals you find in the zoo, which tend to be rather noisy and rather smelly in my experience, but wax seals which keep the scroll of paper tight so you can't read it. And one of the features of uh, the world of the first century when this book was written was that the emperors of Rome, the most powerful uh, people in the Mediterranean world, used to create their will and it would have, uh, their last will and testament, it would have seven seals to show that it must not be opened until they died. But this scroll in the hand of God the Father is a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven soul seals. It's not the last will and testament of a human emperor. It is the will of God which will be worked out in human history, in universal history. It is the destiny of the world. It is the destiny of the universe. It is cosmic history. It is the history of the human race in the context of the great plan of God for all things. It is what will take place and what must take place, and it is in the hand of God, not of humans. Powerful humans are so pretentious, aren't they? They look so powerful, we dress them up as if they're powerful, we serve them as if they're powerful. They fill our te television screens because they're powerful. But human leaders are but dust before the power and authority and greatness and glory of God. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. This is a great question. Not who is clever enough to do it, which is a very human question, nor who has the power to do it, 
which is a human question, but who is worthy to do it? See, we worship cleverness and power, don't we? In our society, we think that cleverness and power will keep us wealthy and happy and wise and prosperous. Our society trusts in cleverness and in power, and it forgets the great question of worthiness. Imagine that if you were voting in an election any time. Who is worthy to be Prime Minister? Who is worthy to govern Australia? It's a great question to ask, isn't it? Who is worthy? Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But the sober reality in verse 3, but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. No animal is worthy. No angel is worthy. No human being is worthy. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah is a reference to uh, Genesis 49. Uh, Judah is a lion's cub, and the root of David to uh, a reference to Isaiah 11, where there is a promise of the root, a branch of Jesse. And one of the exciting things about the book of Revelation is that the words heard often complement the sight seen. So one of the elders said to me, to John, do not weep, see the lion of, the Jew, of Judah, the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then John says, I saw a lamb looking as if it has been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. So he's heard about a lion and he sees a lamb. Isn't that wonderful? A lion speaks of the power of this Jesus. And lamb speaks of his sacrifice. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. I don't know if you've ever seen a dead lamb, but dead lambs look particularly dead, I can tell you, when they're lying in a field. You don't think to yourself, this lamb is about to spring to life. But this lamb, looking as if it had been slain, is a standing lamb, a slaughtered lamb standing, and not standing on the edge of a field, but at the centre of God's throne, at the centre of all power and authority in the universe. A slain lamb standing. Now, we say that John saw Jesus Christ, but actually it was a vision of Christ. The risen Christ doesn't look like a lamb. He looks like a human being because that's who he is, a human being. But he's seeing a vision of him that is uh, a likeness of him, uh, something which was a picture of the reality, the, the reality of Jesus that he, that he had been a lamb sacrificed, as we heard from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, but now standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, that is, worshipped by them. The Lamb had seven horns, all powerful, and seven eyes, all seeing, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the world. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, God the Father. When he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp 
and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They're your prayers. Every time you pray, you're worshipping God. You may pray, God, help me. God, I'm far away from you. God, I don't understand what's happening. You may pray, God, please help this person to get better. You may pray for God's kingdom to come. You may pray, God, be glorified. But all our prayers, spoken or unspoken, are an act of worship accepted by God and seen in heaven. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. You are worthy. Who is worthy was the question. The answer is you Lord Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. Why? Because you were slain. What did your death achieve? With your blood you purchased people for God. And who did you purchase for God? Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And what will the result be? You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. There have been many human empires and many human organisations. Let me tell you about one which is the largest and which has lasted the longest and which includes people from every tribe, language, nation, and people. It is the Church of Jesus Christ. People from every tribe and nation, every ethnic group, and every language are those who gather together to worship the Lamb. The people of God is that group and we in God's mercy are part of that group, that people. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. We are what God's people were called to be in the Old Testament a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, over Easter we had an art exhibition at the church I belong to. We invited people from the congregation to bring their artwork along. We put it up in the church and we invited people from the community to come and enjoy it. And the theme of the artwork was, of course, about... Uh, God and the death and resurrection of Christ. The most, the most wonderful uh, painting, I think, was a very dark canvas of the Garden of Gethsemane at night. And it looked sort of black, but in the centre, just to the right of the centre, was a bit of light and you could see there the lamps of, of, that the soldiers brought as they came to arrest Jesus. And when you look at the picture, your eyes are kind of drawn in towards Jesus Jesus illuminated by the lamps of the soldiers and about to be arrested. Though you can see on one side uh, some disciples running away and a sword dropped on the ground. Well, I want you to look into this picture and see persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And I want to ask God to Keep this vision of God's people from every tribe, language, people and nation uh, deep in your mind and your heart 
and your memory and your desires and your plans for your life. We tend to think of our own lives. We tend to think about the life of our church. But God wants to extend our vision to see his people coming from every tribe and language and people and nation. How will that happen? Only when people from every tribe and language and people and nation hear the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of their salvation. There are currently, at my last count, seven billion people in the world, though there may have been some born uh, since I last counted, seven billion people. Of the seven billion, that's with a b, billion people in the world, two billion, that's with a b, two billion have no access to Christianity at all. No Bible, no church, no teacher or preacher. Isn't that extraordinary? Two billion people who have no access to Christianity even now in our world. Do you know Jesus told us to pray two prayers? What's the first prayer, the Lord's Prayer? How does that start? Oh, you've been to Sunday school. That's terrific. That's wonderful. I'm so pleased. What's the other prayer that Jesus told the disciples to pray? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest. You praying that prayer every day? Lord of the harvest, send out laborers into the harvest? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Lord, send out laborers into the harvest. A friend who lives in England, he told me recently there was a survey of English Protestant churches which discovered that only 25% had children's ministry or young, young youth, youth ministry. Isn't that amazing? Only a quarter of Protestant churches in England have young people and children as members of the church. That's a bit alarming, isn't it? As the church sinks in the West, it is rising in Africa, I'm pleased to say. It's rising in Asia. But there's still great need for workers for the harvest. I was a principal of a Bible college at Ridley College, and uh, often churches ring up and say, we need a youth worker. Have you got a spare youth worker in your course? And I would say, no, we don't. How long since you sent someone to Ridley to be trained to be a youth worker? Oh, we haven't done that. Have you anybody whom you could send to Ridley to be trained as a youth worker? Not really. <laughs> So on a good day, I'd smile, which doesn't actually help with a telephone. But anyway, <laughs> I would smile and say, well, if you don't send someone to college to be trained as a youth worker, why should you expect to get one from the college?
We need to be converted to God. We need to be converted to Jesus Christ. And we need to be converted to God's great gospel plan for the world. We need to be converted to God. We need to be converted to Jesus Christ. And we need to be converted to God's great gospel plan for the world. Why? Because they sang a new song saying, You're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. We know Jesus' words to his disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them. And I am with you always to the close of the age. Is God's great gospel plan at the center of your prayers? When you pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Are you praying for the conversion of millions of people to Christ? Is God's great gospel plan at the center of the life of this church? Is God's great gospel plan at the center of your plans for your own life? Is God's great gospel plan at the center of your conversations, of your prayers, of your giving, of your praying. Are you praying that God would raise up trained gospel workers, laborers for the great gospel harvest? Is your church regularly sending people off to college to train for gospel ministry? Have you said to God, I will do whatever you want me to do to help in your great gospel plan? Have you challenged someone to take part as a full-time worker in this great gospel plan? Have you asked God to put one gospel poor nation on your heart for you to pray for every day? Have you asked the question if you or someone you know should be challenged to become a trained gospel worker to take the good news of Jesus around the world? I beg of you, I urge you, I entreat you, I challenge you to take this matter seriously. To look with Jesus, with compassion on the sheep who have no shepherd. And to pray the Lord of the harvest to raise up laborers for his harvest. For the harvest is great, but the laborers are few.
they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. God, our gracious Father, please keep this vision at the centre of our minds and our prayers and our lives and the life of this church. Help us to take part willingly as we can, as we're able to, in your great gospel plan for this world. That Jesus Christ may be known and worshipped and adored and served. We pray this for his sake and for your glory. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter, for sharing that with us this morning. And uh, I've got the opportunity to actually ask Peter a couple of questions this morning on our behalf, uh, as Peter comes with a lot of experience. And what he shared with us really puts out a challenge to us individually, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It certainly does to me, anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, as many of you all know, I'm uh, part of the missions committee here at the Canterbury Gardens Community Church. But some things that Peter just said, he's alluding to things that maybe we need to think through. And here's my first question for you, Peter. And I, I presume, oh no, you've got a, sure. you've got a mic, sure. haven't you? That's right. How in practical terms do we actually know what God is actually saying to us in terms of mission? Is it, do we sort of look for, sort of flip through the Bible and hope it appears? Or mm. sort of how do we actually know in practice? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I think you can get the big picture from the Bible. So the moment you think of a verse like um, John 3.16 springs to mind, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that all who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So it's the big picture, uh, if you keep that big picture of what the Bible's about, you know then that the message of the gospel is not just that God loves me or that God loves us, but that God loves the world and sent his son for the world. So I think... There are individual verses you can look at, and I've looked at one this morning, John 3, 16 is another one. Uh, but if you keep the big picture, what is God's big plan for the world, then you can ask the question, what is my part in that plan? Yeah. Okay. Another question that came to mind when you were sharing was the prayers of the saints going up to heaven. Now, how effective or how significant is that in terms of the mission program and the yes. plan you're talking yes, about. sure. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure that God in his kindness uses our prayers uh, to, for his own praise to, wor to worship him, to worship Christ. But uh, also he does say to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers. So if you think to yourself, I can't, I'm not at the stage or situation where I can go, then what you should do is pray fervently that the Lord will send out labourers for the harvest. I've noticed often, by the way, that when people are praying, I, I belong to a you know, Bible study group at St Jude's, people, we naturally pray for family needs for somebody sick or somebody uh, uh, who's uh, facing an exam or something like that. We don't always pray for the conversion of our unbelieving relatives and friends. We may pray for the welfare of our church. We don't often pray that God would raise up laborers from our church to go and take the gospel around the world. It's that big picture I'm trying to get across. Yeah. And the other thing that I think I remember you mentioning about the importance of, I think it came out of it, giving. Yes. And... What's your perspective on how we determine how we give into that work and what motivates us to even do that? 
Well, I think the best thing to do is to be focused on your giving. So if you have people who have gone from your church to make sure that you support them, it seems to me if they're members of your church, they've gone wherever they've gone, then praying for them and giving to support their ministry is a, is a first priority. Uh, another thing you might do is ask to put a particular, uh, God to put a particular country or missionary area in your, on your heart so that you learn more and more about it. You, you know, investigate what the country is like, uh, as people did with Nepal, didn't they? People prayed for 40 years for Nepal to open to the gospel. Uh, and they learnt more and more about Nepal. They sent missionaries to North India who'd be ready to get into Nepal when it opened. So they had a very focused prayer on opening the, the uh, Nepal to the gospel, and I think there are now a million be Christian believers in Nepal. So uh, I'm sure if you say to God, what, you know, give me something to do and I'll do it, he'll show us what we should do. Yeah. And in terms of the giving, yeah. I guess those of us who are at home and don't necessarily end up on the mission field itself, yeah. that's one way we can, in fact, be serving the Lord, not just see it as putting it in the yes, plate. Yes, that's that, right. That, yes. Am I correct in Yes, and thinking? significant giving. So my, my own policy is to give more to overseas missions than I do to my local church because the need is so great. That's right. I'm not saying don't give to your church. Do that. That's the right thing to do. But I think we should be uh, extending our giving to make sure that we're giving more to take the gospel out to the whole world. Yeah. Well, ask questions that are related to the actual going and doing and serving. Yeah. Now, we quite often focus on overseas. Yeah. But what about local here in Australia? How do I get a sense of how I might contribute in yes. full-time work? Yes, well... Uh, the, the amazing thing is uh, the number of people who want to do Christian ministry in the eastern suburbs, but not the western suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, there are many uh, migrant groups coming into Australia who aren't Christians, uh, so there's a natural mission field. Uh, I've got a friend who works in the northern in northwest Australia. Uh, they've been trying to get a minister for their church. They've tried 35 ministers. No one will go. So, not a popular location. Not a popular location. But it's a bit like being in the country. It's hard to find doctors to go to, uh, so on. It's the same thing. Uh, so there's, there's, there's lots of need in Australia. There's a, a constant need for youth workers. There's a constant need for people who'll learn... Uh, indigenous languages to serve indigenous people and uh, we have more and more people from overseas uh, from Muslim backgrounds uh, where I live in Carlton uh, in that area there are there are there are thousands of Muslims uh, uh, who don't yet know about Jesus Christ so there are lots of mission fields in Australia it's quite right well, thanks very much, Peter, for sharing with us this morning. And I might get the music team up. Sure. We're going to have one more song. Thanks. And then I'll be fin finishing our time in prayer. Thanks.